Hey, welcome to another episode of the CTO Advisor podcast. I am extremely fortunate in the quality of guests that I always get on the podcast. And today is no exception. We have Sanjeev Mohan, who is the founder of San, uh, Sanjmo uh, advisory firm. He is a former VP of research at Gartner, one of the sharpest people I know in the data analytics space. And we're going to save kind of his specialty for the last part of the conversation. Sanji, welcome to the podcast. Keith, it is such an honor to be on your podcast. I myself feel honored to, to have gotten to know people like you in the industry. I followed you for many years. So it's always humbling to hear someone f- so high up from Gartner has followed me. I'm like, I'm just this uh, lowly independent guy. But now you're independent and you're doing some amazing work. It seems like I'm seeing you everywhere. I saw you not just in my session, in the SuperCloud session yesterday, but you're all over the place. Congratulations on the exposure. And we're going to start the conversation at that SuperCloud. Is this... Yeah, I know we had this conversation yesterday on theCUBE, uh, but is SuperCloud a real thing? I, let's get past the term SuperCloud. Is SuperCloud itself a real thing? I, I think it's a natural progression. You know, it's a natural progression from being single cloud to multi-cloud and now having that kind of abstraction where my workloads can be running across different cloud providers and I don't really care where they're running. I just need an ease of use and span uh, and pick the cloud where I can run my workload in the most cost-effective, reliable and secure manner. So I think it's, it's, it, it will happen. So this is something that we've talked about, it seems like forever. And it's interesting that people are getting pushback. Do you think it's because of the corniness of the term super cloud or are people resistant to the idea that at some point we'll abstract the clouds? I, I think it's a combination of a number of things. Uh, the term itself can be uh, a bit problematic and, and it's not just the term super cloud. We lived with these jargons and terms forever in IT. I mean, you you can even say big data. What exactly is big data? What's a data lake? You know, what's NoSQL? The list goes on and on, uh, you know, uh, when it comes to terms. So terms are always problematic. That's the the issue number one. But the, the thing is that it doesn't matter what the term is. What matters is what does the business want? And if the business says that, you know, I have a certain workload because of data residency requirements, I need to run it in a certain region and the only cloud provider there is X, but rest of it can run in a different region, then it is going to happen irrespective of what we call it. A problem though, is that like in anything that's new, it takes time to mature. And we don't have any standards. And that, I think, is the biggest problem. Right now, if you ask AWS, what do you think about SuperCloud or or Google Cloud or Azure? What are they going to say? They don't want to share the limelight with other cloud providers, right? So they want all workloads should be. That's why we have egress charges. So you stay in a single cloud. So so lack of standards it's a huge impediment to uh, for SuperCloud to become mainstream, in my opinion. Yeah, so I, I think this lack of standards is one of the biggest factors. Whenever I think about the problem around SuperCloud is this ability to abstract away the clouds, but the, the clouds move so fast. And I think some of that is starting to slow down, but the, the clouds move so fast. And when we think about abstracting serverless, you know, you have Lambda, you have cloud functions, you have Knative, you have OpenFast, you have all these different ways to manage the control plane of serverless, but uh, you don't have a centralized way to kind of have one way or one 
abstraction for serverless. So I think that's an opportunity for SuperCloud is to say, I can do functions as a service in a singular way. There's one way to do it all. And then the control plane or the super cloud uh, determines which cloud to run that function on. And that's all handled. That's a super difficult problem to solve. But I think that's like the potential and I think the natural progression of cloud. Let's go on to the next topic that we want to cover, which is the economic situation. Uh, I'm, I'm refraining from calling it a economic downturn. But it is almost impossible to ignore the mainstream media covering all of the layoffs in enterprise tech and tech in general. How should customers be in these companies be thinking about the potential of an economic downturn? So economic downturn is real. Uh, I I. Uh, we see people losing jobs, you know, uh, every day there's some, some news. I think there are ways to protect oneself. I talk to a lot of my clients. They're very small technology companies. Uh, by the way, uh, first of all, Keith, I don't know if you agree with, uh, with me on this, but this this slowdown is, is primarily a technology sector. I don't see this in let's say manufacturing or healthcare or or, or banking for instance like do you see it i mean it's It's interesting the the, the, there's this big talk of slowdown in our industry and everything every industry that we serve seems to be humming along just fine correct yeah so 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 my point is that the the producers of technology or the suppliers of technology are suffering, but the buyers are still pretty robust. Now, if the buyers went down, then we would have this global recession or a massive problem. So this is a time I tell my clients, you need to very carefully think where you are spending the money. For example, a lot of companies I know have uh, point blank fired people, frozen their marketing budgets. And, and to me, that's, that's a kiss of death because the right now, everybody is concerned about burn rate. How do I reduce my burn rate? But the problem is if you stop innovating, if you stop getting your name out, then the effects will be felt maybe two or three quarters from now. So I still think brand awareness is really important. It's really important to be in the news. Uh, find, you know, uh, cost-effective ways of getting your, your name out, but don't retract, you know, uh, uh, don't add, like, for example, I, sometimes they even tell uh, companies, they're like, oh, we are product-led growth. So we are uh, we are taking this time to add more functionality to our product. I'm like, well, but you now you're spending more money and you're telling me burn rate is, is a big issue. You stopped everything else. Your sales has stopped. Your marketing has stopped, but you're adding more functionality. Why are you adding more functionality? Your focus should be on what do I need to do to retain my existing customers and add functionality only, you know, uh, that adds to your depth. Don't start looking into other categories because if you start doing that, then then your product market fit is going to shift. And now you'll have a new problem. So, and and we've seen this play out itself time and time again in the industry. Whether we're talking about marketing, engineering, etc., when you cut too deep to the bone, you put yourself at a disadvantage. You, there may be great short term benefit, but long term, can you meet the needs of the market? Let alone the needs of your customers. The case in point, I saw in the news last week that HPE was being sued by shareholders because when they spun out HPE managed services to form DXE alongside of CSC, uh, the new company cut too far deep in the technical expertise. I was actually a customer of DXE in 2017 
And uh, instead of saving the proposed $1.6 billion in synergies, they end up saving $2.6 or $2.7 billion, which is an amazing short-term savings. But long-term, they couldn't meet the demands of the users. Case in point, I wasn't obviously any longer with that com company in 2019, but that company went on to another service provider, I'm told, because DXC was not meeting the needs of the customer. They lost that deep technical expertise they were known for, for when they were HPE managed services. So yes, this is a, I think this is a good warning point for both enterprise customers and those who create technology that yes, we should be prudent with our resources, but as you mentioned in our pre-banter, measure once. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And and maybe in these times, you measure twice before you come. And you measure frequently. Don't wait, you know, for six months or end of the year to say, okay, how are we doing? So constantly measure, see what programs are doing well. And then readjust your budget and tell everybody, you know what, we are not, the budget is not zero. The budget is, is half. And if you do that and you really focus on your existing customers, retaining them and making them happy, they, I'm guaranteeing these customers will find the money. Maybe you were expecting a million dollar deal, it'll be only half a million. But it, at least it's not zero. You know, as long as you are saving the customer value, uh, saving customer money or showing uh, value, like, for example, in my space, you know, companies are putting in data ops products to so they can deliver faster, you know. So whatever it's, it's agility or cost or whatever it is, as long as you can do that, you know, the, the customers will find you the budget because large enterprises, non-tech enterprises, are still growing. So let's go into the last topic, bouncing off of that, your, your area of expertise, data and data analytics. We're coming out of, both of us were at uh, AWS reInvent and we're coming out of actually some pretty, I want to say they're low key announcements, but pretty substantial announcements out of AWS when it comes to data analytics and overall capability, what's your impression of the announcements in the show? So the announcements are low key because uh, we have reached a, a level of maturity in AWS's journey. For the second year in a row, we were surprised that AWS did not come up with a brand new database, for example. And that's a good thing. We don't want yet another database, already 15 of them or some large number from AWS. What AWS announced at last reInvent is bringing different component services together so people don't have to uh, manually connect them or, or write code to do it. For example, Zero ETL was a very big announcement. So you've got an operation database called Aurora. You've got an analytical database called Redshift. And don't worry, Mr. Customer, AWS is going to take care of it and it's going to make sure that in a very performant way, you can connect these two uh, or you can go to Redshift look at uh, Aurora data through virtualization, all that underpinnings of integration, they're taking care of. So that to me was, was, was a refreshing change in AWS's attitude. When I was uh, in enterprise software sales, I would talk to a CDO because I was in the infrastructure space. And the CDO of a, a large Midwestern bank said that his data analytic, his data scientists spend 70 to 75 to 80% of their time on ETL hmm. actual work of a data scientist. And for me, it seemed obvious that this is a infrastructure problem. If you're spending 70 to 75% of your time on something that's essentially infrastructure, you should invest in infrastructure. So 
I don't know if I was, I obviously wasn't the only one excited about this ETL announcement at uh, AWS. You obviously caught that, this being your area. And the, the, the engineering effort needed to go into reducing the minutiae the minutia of ETL uh, for data scientists will effectively, in some cases, double the output of your data scientists. Correct. Yes. I mean, that, that productivity is, is critical. And, and by the way, there's yet another uh, big announcement for me. Uh, I also cover the space of data governance a lot. Uh, uh, also, uh, data governance is a very loosely defined term. It's just, just like super cloud, actually, to some extent. A lot of people don't like using the term data governance because they feel that it's so many times that it's a taboo to talk about data governance. So, so let's talk about metadata. We have all these things happening, whether it's data or even infrastructure. So Keith, you cover infrastructure topics a lot. So when you build these data pipelines of moving data from, let's say, uh, a, a SaaS application, you use Fivetran, you load it into, into a database, you use DBT, then you use Looker, or you, you know, so you use a combination of these tools. Every one of them produces metadata. That metadata is broken, it's siloed, it sits in everybody's different tools. We we try to fix it with data catalogs, and I think data catalogs have come a long way. So AWS, which up to this point had stayed away from this entire messy metadata area, they had something called Glue, but Glue was very technical and very limited in its scope. So they announced something called Data Zone. So Data Zone is this new business metadata catalog that was the other big announcement. Now, it's still early days. We, uh, I have not yet seen it in action. I only saw it uh, reinvent in the demos, but uh, it's a good step from AWS. Yeah, so ironically, I I, I put this, I had uh, this AWS every day and I cover a different AWS product every day and Data Zone we covered last week. It's in preview and it's a, it is a really interesting solution. If you look at like, uh, I call it the data bricks uh, for AWS. It is their uh, alternative to it. So if you never have to leave AWS, if you have a SaaS provider that's in AWS, if you have all these different data sources and you want to get together your metadata so you can do analysis across these dis separate types of data, data zone seems like the promise, right? Yeah. In fact, you know, uh, AWS is, is, I would say, a little late to the party. Uh, if you look at Google Cloud, they have Google Data Catalog. They announced it a few years ago, and in fact, they don't even sell it anymore. It's embedded. It's, yeah. Right. yeah. And then uh, Microsoft Azure has had its own journey. Uh, they had something called Azure Data Catalog way back, but then they rewrote the whole thing and they came out with Purview, Microsoft Purview, I've heard mixed messages about uh, Purview, but it's a very difficult space uh, to be in. So, so I'm I'm happy that AWS finally has a product, and it'll be great to see how this uh, whole space matures. Sanjeev, it's been great having you on. Wealth of knowledge across several different domains. Where can folks find your musings, writing, research, what you're doing these days? Uh, thank you for those kind words, Keith. I have my website, my company, as you mentioned, is sanjmo.com, uh, but I have not kept my website up to date. It's been many, many months. Uh, the best way to follow me is on LinkedIn. So I'm quite active on LinkedIn. I do have a Medium blog. So I've already written two articles this year. So uh, Keith, you might be interested because you're in the infrastructure space. I wrote uh, my key takeaways from Oracle's Cloud World. Uh, a few months late, but better late than never. My Medium website is sanjmo.medium.com. 
And the last thing that I want to say is that I've been doing a podcast a lot. Last year, I launched my podcast series on YouTube. I don't have the audio-only version. Uh, it's called It Depends. So the link is actually, uh, I can send you the link if you want to put it in the show notes. I'd love people to take a look at it. It's mostly data and analytics. It's called It Depends on YouTube. So those are a few uh, places. So we'll put all of that in the show notes. I love that you have so many uh, platforms and, to engage with in. And I, I will co-sign. You really need to follow him on LinkedIn because he is a prolific LinkedIn uh, poster and engager. He's always engaging in interesting content. You want to find out more about the CTO Advisor, you can find us on the web, thectoadvisor.com. You can follow me on Twitter at CTO Advisor and check out the new AWS every day. I think we're up to 30 different AWS products. Uh, we had Joe Peterson the other day review some security um, products. And I might even ask Sanjeev to do some of the data, the more data analytic centric stuff. So we'll we'll continue to have guest appearances. You want uh, the again, so share the podcast with your friends, family, and coworkers. Talk to you again. Thanks a lot, Sanji. Thank you. I'm just starting my day, and you've already made my day, Keith. Thank you. <laughs>